what is the importance of friendship? And what is the importance of hanging out with the right kinds of people? And why is it the case that we should aspire to uh, hang out with, a, with exactly the right kind of people who have similar values to us? So then again, welcome back to another video essay. So this one is going to be a, uh, be a really big one. So we're going to explain friendship through the lens of, in a sense, the anti-Cartesian tradition of philosophy. Now, if those words scared you off, to this, off of this video, don't worry about it. Here's me trying to sort of like provide an introduction to some of the works of Cartesian thinkers and to sort of anchor these grand philosophical theories into a very practical problem that we can that we can see, that we can touch, that we can smell, and that we can feel. So hopefully after this video essay, you are going to uh, get interested in um, learning more about a Cartesian tradition of philosophy. And I hope this video essay here is going to inspire you to do some deeper reading here. So... We're going to start our investigation into friendship with a thinker by the name of Rene Descartes. So if you've done any introductory reading into um, beginner philosophy or some of the key minds of the Western philosophical tradition, uh, Rene Descartes was such a key player in the founding of uh, a philosophical tradition called a Cartesian philosophical tradition. And he, in a sense, one day, one night, sat down in front of his fireplace with a pad of paper and a quill. And he decided to figure out uh, a method of understanding the world or a method of doubting certain experiences whilst um, sticking to certain principles. Because for a philosopher, if your method, first of all, is flawed, if your philosophical thinking is flawed from the very get-go, then your entire philosophical project is, uh, is in a sense, doomed from the very beginning. Uh, so Descartes was very much concerned with the question of how do we know anything for certain? How do we know that... Um, things exist and how do we exactly know that physics exists or how do we know that um, this table exists so hence he was embarking on a sort of a metaphysical investigation into reality and he did so through using uh, what he considered as the only faculty he could trust which is his own rationality and his own thinking and without a doubt he sat down in front of the fireplace for six days and drafted the meditations on first philosophy and this book was eventually published in 1641 and went on to have such a great impact uh, on the philosophical discourse, on the entire grand philosophical tradition. Now, as any philosopher or any f philosophy student would tell you, that what Descartes had done, on one hand, he founded this tradition, of course, great for philosophy. Of course, he generated this amazing piece of work called the Meditations. But what he had also done is that he had also generated more readings for students of philosophy to do on the reading list because uh, the discourse of Western philosophy or the history of Western philosophy, as soon as there is a school of thought, as soon as there's kind of like something that was said in the discourse, as soon as some, someone proposes something, there has to be someone who opposes it. Right? There has to be another person who comes in and like, I don't quite like what you're saying here. This could be improved. And those people are going to end up being the anti-something-something. Something. Or if someone said something profound in philosophy, it's like, that's the tradition. And someone else comes along, criticizes it, and they become the anti-something tradition. So one of these opposers, so um, and one of these people that countered some of the arguments of Descartes was Spinoza. So Spinoza was, in a sense, an anti-Cartesian thinker. And he, in a sense, took Descartes' model and, in a sense, uh, on one hand, improved it, and on another hand, pointed out many of the flaws of Descartes' thinking. And to really understand what Spinoza was was really on about, or to really understand like why anti-Cartesian, you know, because it's it's such a great leap forward for philosophy. It essentially uh, founded the start of the, the the modern philosophical discourse, right? But then we have to first understand this argument or this hot debate that was happening in 17th century philosophy, which is the debate about God. So many of the finest minds in philosophy took a stab at this problem. Many of the finest minds, ranging from Isaac Newton to Blaise Pascal to Nicolas Melbranche, they've all had their own crazy theories about the existence of God or how God is supposed to work or um, the existence of God and its relation to everyday reality. So they've all had their separate versions of this speculation on God, but... The philosophical climate at the time was that we need to figure out how God works for us to really develop a philosophy. We need to know our relationship to God, because at the time it was quite a um, it was quite a religious society too. 
and it was largely largely dominated by uh, various concerns from the church and the church and the state. There was a kind of like a really complicated relationship there. But the key philosophical question was, how do we know if God, how do we know the existence of God? How do we gain access to this existence of God? And how do we develop, develop a theory to explain the relationship between God and reality? So to really understand what Spinoza's position was, uh, we have to, first of all, start from the Cartesian, and then we can bring in the anti-Cartesian to really explain this entire thing. So Descartes, as he was pondering uh, in front of the fireplace, uh, wrote down in his fifth meditations, a very, very confusing paragraph, which I'll link in a companion article below. So this paragraph essentially was saying that he wanted to prove the existence of God. Through what method? The method that Descartes came up with was that if we can know a thing for certain, if we can know an idea, a very distinct idea, um, or for example, the idea of number two, or the idea of you know three sides, three sides of a triangle, or the definition of a triangle, or there are certain concepts to Descartes that are completely irrefutable. You do not even need to observe that thing in reality to prove that it, to kind of like prove that it exists. You know, the number two, it just exists. And, you know, the form of a triangle, it just kind of exists. It's just right there. It's clear and distinct in our heads. We don't need to doubt it. So these are perfect, very distinct ideas. These are sort of like polished up ideas in our heads. So since, and for Descartes, since God is a supremely perfect being, since God is, you know, all of perfection, since God is this almighty being that's absolutely perfect, then isn't it the case that God also exists as a perfect idea in our heads? And isn't the entire project of capturing God just a mere process of um, weaving through all of the confusing uh, attributes of God and eventually find our way to this very clear, distinct idea of God? Just like how we arrive at a very clear and distinct idea of the number two or three sides of a triangle or certain sort of like indubitable facts. So that was Descartes' thinking. And since God had created everything there is to learn about in reality, isn't it the case that if we think hard enough, if we reason through the right mechanisms, if we follow Descartes' doubts, if we get rid of all the contrivances and appearances, that one day we can understand everything there is to understand in the universe um, because we have this thinking faculty? Can't we just get through... Uh, in a sense, we can get to all the truths about reality through this process of reasoning. Hence, we can spend a lot of time in front of the fireplace, and if we think hard enough, we can explain the entire universe, right? So that's a very gross simplification of Descartes' argument, but nevertheless, it provides us with a very um, good starting point to see what Spinoza was on about. So Spinoza, like many great philosophers, if there's one thing that philosophers had learned how to do really well, that is to spot any bullshit in sort of like grand claims about the universe, really big claims about the universe. And Descartes, what Descartes was claiming here was quite radical. It's just kind of like we can reason our way to truth. We can think rationally and explain away the universe in these very logically understandable ways. If we have the thinking faculties to get, get rid of all uh, sort of like appearances, doubts, fake stuff, and then um, illusions and hallucinations, one day we can arrive at these clear and distinct ideas about the universe that are absolutely correct. So Spinoza, in a sense, read Descartes, and his bullshit radar, in a sense, went off. It's just kind of like, um, hang on, hang on a minute. So Descartes, you're saying that you can use human faculties to reach divinity? So you can, you're can, you saying that you can encapsulate God in a formula? That you can sort of like take something that is so divine and total and try to box them up in some clear, distinct idea. So, in a sense, Spinoza's anti-Cartesianism came in through this very point. So, for Spinoza, because God is so total, because God is such, a, um, such an absolute being, because God is so total that... The, the, the sort of the effort for us to think reasonably to reach God, it's in a sense still a wild goose chase because we're still trapped within human ideas. We're still trapped within the human chain of reasoning, logic, rationality. So for, for Spinoza, in a sense, these ideas, they're fundamentally still human. 
these ideas, they're still kind of like human logic. They're still kind of like us running circles in our heads, no matter how hard we try and no matter how many theories and concepts that we jump through and no matter how many fictions that we invent about reality, uh, we're still not, not really going to reach the existence of God. So in a paragraph, he basically said um, in his uh, correction of understanding, so in a sense, he tried to correct what Descartes was on about. So in his correction of, of understanding, Spinoza basically explained that the human mind is really good at inventing fictions. And the more fiction that it invents, the, the farther away it is from actual the actual existence of God. So in a sense, he um, considered Descartes as, you know, putting a cart in front of the horse. It's just kind of like, Descartes, you're confusing the effects of God with the, 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 the cause of God. You're confusing uh, the essence or the origin of God. Uh, you're confusing that sort of origin with all these attributes or all these sort of like modes that God is giving to us. So you're lost, still lost in human logic, whereas in fact, you're just running in circles, but no amounts of human thinking can actually reach the total existence of God. So that was the key critique, one of the key critiques that Spinoza had against um, Descartes. So in a sense, Spinoza considered human, the human chain of thinking as completely separate from the sort of like the God plane of thinking. So for Spinoza, even though there's a sort of like a parallel between uh, the God plane of existence and human plane of existence, when we're reasoning or when we're trying to reach God through reasoning, we're still just bouncing around in this human chain. Right? We're still thinking in human terms. We're still thinking in terms of human rationality. So in a sense, we're still trapped in our own little human worlds without direct access to you know, this line over here. But the two lines, in a sense, they run in parallels. And this is a very important concept called parallelism in which you know, there's this chain that we cannot access through any amounts of reasoning, through any amounts of like human jibber-jabbering here. So in a sense, through his anti-Cartesianism, uh, he killed the hope of one day encapsulating God in a formula. He killed the hope of one day being able to rationally explain everything there is to explain in the universe. And of course, he was hated for it. Many people didn't agree with Spinoza. And he was one of these like infamous figures in the, um, uh, in the Western philosophical tradition. But even then, even when Spinoza claimed that human ideas are still mere human ideas, even with that premise in place, even though when we're reasoning, when we're thinking about reality, when we're thinking about God, even, um, even when ideas are still human, even when we know that we're still limited human beings, that we can't really reason our ways to God, Spinoza still uh, very much believed in human ideas. Spinoza still very much believed in the power of thinking, of rash, rationality, and uh, the power of concepts and theories, the power of human imaginations, or the power of... Um, uh, human beings' affections for one another. And here is a key distinction that Spinoza drew, uh, even, even within this human chain of thinking. And he drew a distinction between uh, adequate ideas and inadequate ideas. So, uh, in a sense, adequate ideas are those ideas that are in closer parallelism with that plane of God, or they're in closer alignment with the total existence of God. Even though we cannot reach God directly, not through logical reasoning, but there are certain ideas that are closer to God uh, than other ideas. And inadequate ideas are, in a sense, uh, wild ideas that are tinted by human passion or human squabbles and human pettiness. Um, hum human pettiness. So inadequate ideas are, in a sense, contaminated ideas that are not in parallel with this other plane of um, God's operation. So there are certain ideas that are adequate, and these ideas are, in a sense, going to give us a power, uh, an empowering feeling. But there are other ideas that are tinted by human, sort of like human small-mindedness, that are out of alignment with sort of like an ethical way of being with God, or an ethical way of behaving. So in the 17th century, that was a very rather, you know, radical claim. Because most people, when they read the Bible, when they read a certain thing, they take that thing as a, as a direct gospel. They believe every word of the Bible because they think it's um, you know, some sort of like sacred text. But then what Spinoza is simply pointing out is that 
The Bible and the holy names are simply giving you adequate ideas to get you closer to the actual existence of God. They're merely signifiers to something beyond our thinking, but they're not the, the thing itself. They're not the fiction in, in itself. And to really reach this total existence, uh, you have to clo align yourself closer and closer with those adequate ideas. You, know, you can't do this just through reading stories or thinking alone. You have to then sort of like pinpoint these adequate ideas and, to, and the entire pra practice of ethics is to distinguish between, just make a very clear distinction between the two kinds of ideas and to align yourself as closely as possible to adequate ideas. So how do we apply such an idea to friendships? How do we apply such an idea to the theory of friendships? So, so far, we took a very long journey through um, the Cartesian tradition then to the anti-Cartesian tradition. And now here is sort of like um, the, the reward at the very end of the video. So Spinoza went on further to develop an idea of, um, of uh, finite modes. So Spinoza wasn't just speculating about the total existence of God, but he also was very much concerned about human bondage or how human beings tend to interact with one another and you know the ways that we make each other miserable and happy and all that kind of stuff. So as a human being, as a finite form, Spinoza basically argued that we, you know, each and one of us, we hold a collection of adequate and inadequate ideas. We have a certain collection of these ideas and these collections of ideas are in a sense modes of existence, relations within themselves. And then we're all balls of different ideas. We all have our own very different values. And we all have these values that will, will in a sense clash with another person's. Or we have our own little internal relations, but these internal relations are gonna clash with the internal relations of another human being. And in a sense, in the fact that we are finite, the fact that we are trapped within our own little bubbles of thinking, in a sense, we have our own values, values that we're trying to fulfill. When we encounter another person, these values will either go, um, will either get challenged, or if you meet the wrong kind of person, it will entirely get demolished. And then uh, Deleuze, in his monographic study, he basically had a beautiful phrase, which is like, there's no battle that is not brutal. So in a sense, if you meet a wrong person, if you meet the kind of person that's not exactly right for you, what's going to happen is that your internal relation, this very complex web that you have over here, a collection of adequate and inadequate ideas, those ideas will, in a sense, um, they, they will be challenged and if, if not demolished. So in a sense, you have to compromise a part of yourself just to be in a company of another person. And this is manifested, as Spinoza explained, as a certain kind of sadness. It diminishes your power to act or your own power of action is diminished because you've compromised your values. And whether or not you believe in God or not, that's irrelevant, but you've experienced this on a very personal level. If you're in a company of someone that you don't quite vibe with, you're kind of like, you're trying to like, you're trying to be someone else just to be in their company. You're trying to be something else or a whole different values just to please the other person. You're destroying your own internal relations. You're destroying your own internal values. Whereas on the other hand, if you meet a person who's really um, on par with you, who's really kind of like in direct accordance with you, who really agrees with everything, everything you're saying, who really has your best interest in mind, two things are going to happen. One thing is that your internal relation or your collection of ideas and adequate, adequate ideas, your mode will first of all be preserved. So in a sense, you can be completely yourself around this person. And the second thing that's going to happen is that because these things are preserved, we are free to act in a act from, from our own finite natures. So we know human beings are limited and we know that we have certain values, values that are very partial. Nevertheless, we can still act from a place that's from our nature. We can still act authentically. So the second thing that's, that's going to happen is that um, through having this sort of good feeling of acting from our own natures, that reinforces our, or aids our ability to act. It reinforces our own power of action. And in a sense, that entire process is going to nudge us a little bit closer to adequate ideas. That entire process wouldn't destroy our values, but it would only guide us closer and closer towards more and more adequate values and more and more aspirational goals. So in a sense, uh, practically speaking, this is, when, this is what happens when you meet a person at a party that you cannot stop talking to. 
this is what happens when you meet someone on a date uh, who you really click with. It's like simultaneously your authentic uh, self is preserved or your, your authentic internal relation is preserved. And at the same time, if you're lucky, this person is going to give you a sense of power or a sense of internal uh, congruency with yourself. And the sense of power to act is going to inspire or inspire you to pursue higher goals and ideals, to align yourself with higher ideas or higher aspirational values or more adequate ideas. And in religious terms, you know, closer to God. Now, I want you to realize that we're not exactly making a religious claim here. We're not exactly making a claim that's at all about religion. But this entire exercise that we went through, this exercise of thinking about reality in terms of metaphysics, in terms of uh, epistemology, the study of knowledge, and ethics, that there's an inherent connection between the speculation of metaphysics and ethics. And I personally think that, for me at least, I have to really understand how a thing works before I can really know how to conduct myself in friendships, in relationships, and that kind of stuff. And this is exactly what I want to do with my work in the future, is to sort of like provide guidance from the perspective of philosophy to really show you the practical power of philosophy. So in a sense, in today's video essay, we've addressed friendships. And in another video essay, I might address something else. But the common theme here, uh, the common theme here is still very much the same. We're trying to become more, um, we're trying to make ourselves into better and better thinkers. Nevertheless, that's all I have for today. There is a Buy Me a Coffee page if you want to support this channel. And of course, there's a playlist of all the other extended video essays. And stick around for more. R.C. Walden here, signing off.